for this talk this afternoon. We have Wesley McGrew. He's going to be talking about covert post-exploitation forensics with Metasploit. Thank you. So, uh, to, so covert post-exploitation forensics with Metasploit, I think it's one of the longer titles here. Uh, to go over why I selected this as my topic, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the different hats that I wear. So you see two different affiliations on, on the screen right now. So my day job is with the Mississippi State University National Forensics Training Center. It's a very rewarding job. So in that position, I teach law enforcement and wounded veterans that have come back from Iraq and Afghanistan um, how to do digital forensics, how to get started in it. Uh, with the with the hope that they that the, the veterans would either find work in the private sector or with local or state law enforcement, uh, the the law enforcement side of that, the uh, the uh, attendees will uh, go on from being uh, any level of law enforcement, whether it's the IT guy that works for that at a branch of law enforcement that's getting into doing investigative case work, or if it's a beat cop looking to improve their skill set. Uh, by the end of a two-week training program, uh, an intro course and an advanced course, uh, they're able to do some simple investigations and understand the fundamentals of forensics, uh, digital forensics at least. So the idea with that is, is after they get out of those classes, they're then able to start working cases uh, like child porn cases, uh, some white collar crime cases and things like that, mostly the child porn cases. So in Mississippi, for example, uh, one of the, uh, one of the the biggest concerns is that there used to only be one lab in the entire state that could handle child porn cases or that could handle any kind of digital investigation, and that was at the state attorney general's office. And they had such a huge backlog of, uh, of cases that there was going to be a two-year waiting period on getting, the turn, getting those turned around. So uh, we started putting equipment and training in the hands of local law enforcement to try to improve that. So, so that's what I do during my day job. That's what I do from 8 to 5. Uh, after hours, uh, I put on my slightly darker gray hat and, uh, and become McGrewSecurity.com. Uh, that's where I break things. I work on tools for penetration testing. I work on, uh, on, on weird forensic tools and things like that. So. Uh, network forensics, that sort of thing. So with McGrewSecurity.com, the more penetration testing, exploit-oriented side of things, and the Forensics Training Center, we, I decided to, uh, to put something together for both Black Hat and DEF CON. So uh, w one of the things that inspired me from it was from the DEF CON 19 call for papers, there was a, a one little line there that said that they were looking for James Bond, man from uncle type spy stuff, which is a huge thing for me. I like any kind of spy stuff movie, any kind of heist movie, anything like that. So I thought, okay, it's time to get sneaky with this sort of thing. So what I came up with was this talk, uh, covert post-exploitation forensics, sort of going off the rails of what we would normally do in a forensic investigation, uh, really without very much regard for the legalities of it just yet. I figure we'll, you know, we'll recreate, recreate the, te the technology for it uh, and then uh, worry about what situations we can use it in later, uh, and also uh, uh, giving something to the penetration testing community at the same time. So to explain the title, covert, without the subject's knowledge. So most forensics takes place in a situation where the subject of the investigation knows that they are being investigated. So, uh, uh, so at that point, their behavior changes. Uh, uh, they won't continue to do crimes, probably. Uh, we'll see. Um, but uh, we want to do forensics without the subject's knowledge. So uh, that's a problem when it's somebody's hardware, somebody's gear. So uh, to, to accomplish this, we do this post-exploitation. So after a remote compromise uh, or a local backdoor, anything that you can get a meterpreter shell up and running on. So this talk uses Metasploit. It's, it's a, you know, kind of an obscure tool. You may have heard of it. Um, and so uh, after exploitation, we want to be able to uh, perform forensics on something. And, and it's in, in essence, when we're talking about digital forensics, we are interested in reconstructing data above and beyond what the su subject anticipates. So we want to reconstruct you know, what files did they have, what were their actions on the system. Uh, but we want to do it in a way that we dig a little bit deeper than what even they see and understand on the system. So most people who, who use computers on a day-to-day -day basis, not anybody here, but 
but uh, the lay person using a computer, or, or they see their files as the things that they see from their desktop, or the things that they see in their My Documents folder, or their Documents and Downloads folder, the things that are in their or FrostWire downloads folder, that sort of thing. They don't really dig much any deeper into that. They have no idea how it's implemented at any lower level or what happens when they throw things in the recycling bin and, and throw them away. So uh, people who are in situations like that that are doing crimes, that are collecting child pornography or communicating with terrorists or whatever, are, uh, are, are conspiring to perform SQL injection on, on random people. Uh, those sort of people, they may, uh, they, they may not fully understand what happens when they delete data or when they try to cover their tracks. They may realize that, you know, hey, if I have this specific kind of file here, that's a bad thing and that somebody may come after me for it, so I'm going to delete this thing or, or keep it in a true crypt volume or something of that nature. Uh, but they may not understand how that data may le leak out onto other parts of their hard drive. And it's a, it's a fundamental misunderstanding with, with what you see and the layers of abstraction between that and how it's implemented, how things are actually written to disk. Uh, it's the same way with application security. It, it, you, you can understand how things operate at the, at the user level, what you, what you click on to do what, or, or even how to configure a server or something, but you may not understand exactly how that program op um, interacts with the operating system and how memory is allocated and things like that. So we're taking advantage of that misunderstanding between different layers of abstraction to pull out extra data. So I'm taking my forensics interests and my penetration testing interests and I put a slash there for other offensive operations. Maybe you're not really strictly doing this for penetration testing. Maybe, a, uh, maybe you're, a, you're a representative of some nation state and you wish to do this against others. Um, uh, that sort of thing. But we'll, all, we'll call it penetration testing for this. So for this, this is the peanut butter and jelly of, of my talk here, is, is combining this forensics with the penetration testing. So uh, well, especially on the penetration testing side of things, I think that there's a lot that be, can, can be gained from applying uh, the sorts of techniques that digital, invest, digital forensic investigators use to find information on suspects' hard drives. A lot of that can be used by penetration testers to get more value out of each and every system that they break into. So, uh, I mean, the whole point of breaking into the system as a penetration tester, one, to put it on your report, but also to, to gain more information that, that, ex that basically illustrates how serious the compromise is or will help you get gain access to other systems. So for the forensics geeks, the, the whole point of this talk is, um, is this covert and remote aspect of doing this forensics. So, uh, uh, so doing this remotely and doing this covertly, one may mean that if we don't have the suspect's location or the subject of the investigation's location, it may not necessarily be a problem anymore. Uh, if we haven't tracked down exactly where they are, then, then uh, if we can at least compromise their system remotely through some um, vulnerability or uh, are tricking them or social engineering attack, anything from set that gets some interpreter up and going or something like that. If we can get something like that going, we can start performing forensics on their system before we even locate them. We may even be able to use that information to locate the suspect. Uh, we can do this acquisition and analysis in a way that, they, that the suspect may not necessarily realize that, uh, that they've been acquired and analyzed. Uh, and this may, be, this may be important in some situations. In a lot of situations, it's not. I mean, the, the general procedure typically is to, is to have a suspect and to get your warrant and with the location and everything and exactly what you're going to search and seize and everything. Uh, and then you go in and you take their stuff, basically. Or you do an on-site uh, examination. Uh, but there may be situations where that's not necessarily the case. Uh, there may be cases with organized crime where or you don't necessarily want that person to stop doing what they're doing, or you don't want to tip off what you're doing uh, for the sake of some other aspect of an investigation. Uh, so by doing this in a very sneaky and, and sly way and everything, we may be, able to do, may be able to get our information without tipping our hand for the rest of the investigation. And for the forensic skis, it's important to be able to use familiar tools for or your examination. So, uh, People who are into digital forensics typically go into training for something like 
I could access data's forensics toolkit. They'll go to weeks of, of, of ACE training, the access data certified examiner, or the NK certified examiner training. And they'll do that in order to, um, in order to, to, to know how they're going to do their investigations, essentially. So uh, uh, they're used to those tools. Uh, and they don't want to have to relearn the wheel, essentially, or, or reinvent the wheel on doing this remotely. They'd rather be able to use their existing, current forensics tools that are already out there. And those would include, you know, open source tools like Brian Carrier's awesome uh, sleuth kit and autopsy. Uh, there's some other open source toolkits out there. Uh, the digital forensics framework looks really nice. I haven't played with it a whole lot yet, but I'm, I'm looking forward to. PTK is all right in some cases. I've, I've played around with PTK a bit and anything, but I'm annoyed that it doesn't really handle disk images with multiple partitions very well. Um, on the commercial side of things, obviously, we have InCase, and, and, and the guidance software folks are, have a booth here, uh, and access data with the Forensics Toolkit. Forensics Toolkit is what we typically teach uh, a, a little bit of in our, in, our, uh, in our National Forensics Training Center classes. Uh, in our classes, we try to be vendor neutral. However, we do use some of Access Data's tools. Especially with Access Data, there's a really nice tool that they put out for free, FTK Imager, which is intended to be a free tool that you can just put on a USB thumb drive, not worry about the licensing, and be able to image drives for later forensic analysis. But it turns out there's some pretty cool little tools in there for pulling out deleted files, looking at Slack space, examining disks directly, and things like that. And um, for our law enforcement classes, we frequently teach, uh, or, or mostly teach, how to use free tools like the open source tools that are out there, as well as free and in free beer tools like FTK Imager, because uh, most of these guys don't have a whole lot of funding for uh, for uh, buying forensics software licenses. Now, for the penetration testing geeks, which I believe, I would think that it would probably be outnumbering the forensics geeks in this talk. But for the penetration testing geeks, we want to give you more value for your, for your money. We want you to take these tools that, that forensics geeks have been using for, for a while now to get lots and lots of low-level data out of systems and apply it to what you're doing. Now, I know that a lot of, uh, a lot of geeks uh, uh, who do penetration testing, uh, they're, they, the, the better ones already do some forensics type stuff and everything and are interested in forensics, especially network forensics. Um, but this brings some of the file system level forensics into uh, something that they can use. So there's a potential for more important data to be gathered per compromised system. So not only are we looking at the, the data that, uh, that's out there and that we can see if we're if we're compromising a system and we're in there and we have an interpreter shell and we can go and look at all the files that are listed, that's, that's one interface for looking at the file system. But there's other information on that disk. There's the files that have been deleted. There's files that have been resized and there's Slack space that contains older data. There's, uh, there's potentially stuff out there in, in free space that it, there's nothing pointing to in the file system uh, metadata. So we want to be able to gather that stuff up because chances are if somebody thought it was, it was interesting enough that they needed to delete it, maybe that's something that we're interested in seeing. Uh, one important thing, one big thing for, for me on this is, is uh, if you talk to somebody and they, and they have personally identifiable information that they run through a system, they may say, we don't keep that data. We don't keep credit card information. We don't keep everything with the CVV numbers and all of that. Anything we don't keep that data, so if somebody compromises our system, you know we're not out that much, and, and our customers aren't out that much. Well, depending on how that data is deleted, it may be that um, depending on how it's deleted, it may be that it's recoverable using these techniques, whereas it normally wouldn't have been recoverable using uh, what's you know standard in Metasploit or other exploitation frameworks or homebrew stuff right now. So your normal file system interface doesn't show it. Uh, we may be able to find multiple revisions of files. We may be able to find files before something has been redacted, before something has been removed from the file. We may be able to find old data like that. Uh, one big thing is data carving. One of the most interesting things we do in, in, the, uh, in, in the Forensics Training Center classes is we, is we teach people how data carving works and how, how if you have essentially a bag of bits, essentially the, either a corrupted file system where the, all the file system metadata is gone, your your MFT 
for NTFS or your FAT table for or FAT32, if that's blown away, somebody started uh, wiping a disk and, and it stopped very quickly, but it, you know, it winds up going over that first part with all that information. Um, if you just have that bag of bits and you have nothing pointing to where the files are allocated in that gigs and gigs of space, uh, we want to be able to pull that out. And the way we pull that out is with data carving tools like Foremost and Magic Rescue and things of that nature that can look for the signatures of files, the headers that we, are, that we know of. We know that, that JPEGs start with a certain byte sequence. We know that it, Microsoft Office files start with another byte sequence. And we can basically do a brute force, start at the beginning of the disk, roll to the end of the disk, looking for those headers and pulling out files without having known where they were allocated to previously. So we may want to be able to do that sort of data carving on free space on a victim's hard drive or other drives that are hooked up to the system. Another useful aspect of being able to, to, to do forensics on these remote systems is for general purpose scripting. Now the tools that I'm going to show you uh, in this talk, the, the post modules that, that we're going to demo here, the, the whole point of those is that we basically bring in the remote block device into a local block device, which we can then treat uh, treat as if it were our own. Um, we can treat it as if we had hooked the drive up with a write blocker or something like that. So the, the nice thing here is, is we can do, we can run any script that we would normally run on our local file system on the remote file system. So we can mount that, we can mount that partition onto our local file system and uh, run any number of tools that we've written. Any, it doesn't have to be a Metasploit module at that point. It doesn't have to be anything special even. It can just be any tool that you want to uh, run on that. So uh, you may, there may be tools that are out there to scan file systems. I think there's one un called Spider or something that will look for uh, personally identifiable information, credit card information, social security numbers, that sort of thing. They would look for that in a file system by going through each file and looking through it with, uh, with regexes and stuff. You could run that on a victim's hard drive with this without there being any visible indication of that on their system and without having to load these tools onto the victim system. Um, and, it's, and for that reason, it's stealthy. Is we're not uh, necessarily pulling anything, we're not adding any files to the victim's file system, we're not, uh, we're not uh, popping anything up on their computers. We can run our bog standard GUI e, e point and click forensicator type tools on these remote file systems without there being any indication of it. So the typical forensic examination scenarios involve hardware seizure, uh, either that or on-site examination. So we either, we either take their stuff or we look at their stuff on-site and anything. And uh, so that's, that's sort of the typical law enforcement approach to this. Um, in some cases in, in corporate uh, uh, enterprise type scenarios, you may have uh, authorized software agents installed on the end system. So oh, in that case, uh, I believe InCase has a product that does this where across an organization each individual computer has, has, uh, has I don't know what it's called, but it's some sort of InCase agent installed on it and anything that allows a central system, a central investigation examiner workstation to connect to those systems and essentially mount those drives and, and perform forensics on them. Now that's sort of what we're doing here except if it's not something that, that's going to pop up and say are you agreeing to these license terms that you're going to be monitored and things like that. We're sort of uh, sneaking our way in. In all these types of situations, in all typical forensic examination scenarios right now, the suspect or subject is aware. If, we, if, uh, if some intelligence agency or some um, federal law enforcement agency wanted to perform forensics on a system without that person knowing about it, they would have to uh, physically go there while that person is away. Uh, hook up and, and perform and either take an image for later analysis or perform their analysis right there and then put everything back the way they found it and leave. So it, it involves some sort of physical presence there. Uh, what we're doing here is, is suggesting that that can also be done remotely. Um, on the penetration testing side of things, that means that we can do this for our clients. So there's, there's, there, there are you know, obvious questions as to when should you know, federal law enforcement, in, or any law enforcement for that matter, be allowed to do this. Um, of course, intelligence agencies and everything are going to essentially do whatever they want. Um, but at, at, despite the questions that you would have on the law enforcement side of things, things uh, 
at least the penetration tester can use this on their client systems, uh, no problem. So with the covert remote forensics, we're doing this with an unaware suspect. We can do this without knowing a physical, local, physical location, and we can do it one of two ways. We can do this using a remote imaging type sy system where uh, we're essentially hooking the, the remote hard drive up to a, uh, a virtual write blocker. Essentially, it, uh, one of the things that's done on doing in forensics uh, as is right now is to take the, the, take the suspect's hard drive out, uh, hook it up to a, a USB IDE or SATA to a USB adapter, and, uh, and, and that adapter have the capability to write block. Because we don't want to change any of the information. By simply hooking up a drive to, uh, to a Windows machine or, or even a Linux machine if you're not careful, uh, you're going to make modifications to that drive. There's going to be things changing it at the very least in the file system metadata saying, oh, this drive's been mounted so many times without being, in, uh, without being clean. On the Windows side of things, it's even worse. Uh, if, you, if you hook up a drive to Windows, it's likely to start creating you know, a recycle bins for it and, and setting it up and asking you to format and things like that. Uh, examining the drive so it hits all of the, uh, the last access times on them. So to avoid all that, we normally, eat with, with the in-person, in, in-your-face type forensics, we typically hook things up with write blockers. This system, this, the tools that I'm going to show you are essentially virtual write blockers in that way, in that we are mapping those remote drives to local drives and not allowing or, or not even trying to make any function calls to, to write to those disks. So we can remotely image those drives without out tampering with the evidence too much. Uh, now, of course, there's going to be some impact on the system by compromising it with a Metasploit module and loading Meterpreter up into memory, but it's fairly minimal as far as that sort of thing goes. In addition to doing this remote imaging, we also want to do remote block device access. We want to be able to run these off-the-shelf forensics tools on the victim's hard drive without having to make that image. We want to be able to uh, uh, very quickly get at the data we want. So, uh, uh, so, so two things here, the, avoiding the need to, uh, to image the entire drive over a network, but also allowing us to use our, our standard off-the-shelf tools. So this is useful. Intelligence agencies, penetration testers upping your post-exploitation game. Uh, for compliance, I think this is interesting. I think, Inc., uh, I'm not familiar very much with the standards for PCI or HIPAA or anything like that. Uh, but I'm sure that there's, there's information in there saying, and, and there, there, there may not be, there may be information in there saying that you have to, to securely delete this data. I'm sure there's stuff in there where you have to delete this, this particular type of personally identifiable information. This personally identifiable information need not be on this computer or this publicly, act, publicly accessible computer or on this particular web server. Well, if either they say you can't securely delete it or, they, or that you can delete it, you can basically uh, verify that this is the case with tools like this. You can see, did they, a, uh, did they delete that stuff securely? Did they a, uh, use, use a, a wiping program to override it with zeros and ones or whatever or before they uh, removed it from the file system? Or did they just call some unlink function in the operating system to remove it from the master file table? So that all that information is still sitting out there in free space. And of course, this can be used by criminals. And while there's probably not too many in this audience, when I present at DEF CON on Friday, there might be. So uh, we cater to all of our audiences here. So forensics for people who break things. So uh, uh, at, at Mississippi State University, we have a semester-long class in digital forensics for our, uh, for our, our, our undergraduates and graduate students who are going for their information assurance certificate. And then in that class, they learn all about file system forensics. The textbook is literally the, the Brian Carrier file system forensics book. Great book. Um, they, they learn how to, uh, uh, how to pull deleted data out. They create uh, mock cases. And midway through the semester, they swap up those VMware images and disk images for those mock cases with other groups. And then they spend the rest of the semester, for the most part, examining those cases and investigating those cases. And at the end, they, they'll go through and, uh, and, and have mock trials. We usually try to get some real lawyers and, and judges in on that. And it's a very interesting thing. But that's a semester-long class. 
Uh, for law enforcement, we split it up into week-long courses where we just teach them the basics, and we have a different focus for that. Our semester-long classes are for computer science students who already have some idea as to where the power button is uh, and, 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 you know, what all the shift buttons are on things, like the underscore is the shift minus sign, you know, that sort of thing we have to go through. So we have, and this, but despite this, we have very motivated students in those courses, probably more motivated than the, than the computer science students. And so after a couple of weeks of these courses, uh, they're fairly well, well versed in, in, in the basics of file system forensics and how to use the tools to find what they need to find for most cases. And they can always call us up or come to more, or more advanced courses after that. Now, when I'm giving a talk to penetration testers, this is not to scale, obviously, uh, in, that, uh, in that I have, you know, an hour and 15 minutes plus a demo, or, or including demo time and questions and everything to, to present, you know, the basics of forensics to penetration testers. Now, thankfully, y'all both have the, the skill of the computer science guys, or probably a little bit more, and a lot more drive than, than any of these folks to learn. So y'all are motivated by money. So, so, uh, so anything that can give you some uh, edge on everybody else for uh, making some money on this is good. So file system forensic capabilities, some of the things that we can do beyond just allocated files are here. Now, allocated files, they're out there. I mean, you can view those through any interface, through your normal file system browsing interfaces for any exploitation tool that's out there that lets you, you know, LS or DIR and, and pull down files and look at them and things like that. That's all there. That's all there because the operating system hands it to you on a silver platter. You have your file system metadata that has file records that point to the clusters on the disk that hold this data. Now, once you delete a file, once you throw it in the recycling bin and empty it out, or you delete it from the command line, or you have some software program that's deleting things as you go, something that somebody's written, uh, any kind of deleted file, uh, the, the operating system doesn't uh, spend a whole lot of time uh, making things secure for you. The assumption is, from Microsoft and from any other operating system, to be fair, is that you'd rather it be fast than secure, and so are, are fast than, than assuring your privacy. So uh, if you delete a 600 meg file off of your computer, or, or it doesn't take very long unless you have it set to wipe it every time, in which case it is going to take a while because it has to overwrite that with, with old data or with, with, with zeros and ones and things like that. It overwrites the old data. Uh, if you delete a file, I'll, uh, normally all that happens is the file system record gets marked as deleted. Now, in the old FAT32, it would change the first character of the file name. If, if, it's on the, if it's in the master file table of NTFS, it's just, being, it's just marked as deleted. It's bad. Uh, so you don't even lose that first character of the file name. But for a while, that file record will exist in the master file table with all the old information pointing to exactly where on the disk it was. And, and that file record still points to valid data. It doesn't bother going out and overwriting that data until it needs the space again. And depending on how Windows decides to allocate data on the disk, it may take it a while. Uh, from what I've seen roughly, it's hard to predict exactly how Windows does this, although I'm sure some people have reverse engineered it out in great detail. It seems like, like it just, it has a strategy where it just moves from the beginning of the disk on out until it wants to come back and overwrite data. So it can be a long period of time before, or anything gets, um, before anything gets overwritten by old data, I mean by new data. Uh, in addition to deleted files, there's all sorts of other stuff out there that has, um, that's of interest. So there's Slack space, uh, and that's essentially a, uh, when you're looking at, uh, in, the, in the context of a file, uh, if you're looking at how a file is allocated on the disk, it's allocated out to a set of clusters on the disk, which are broken up into individual sectors. Each sector on a hard drive is 512 bytes, half a kilobyte. Uh, the file system further divides that up into sectors and everything, so groups up 4 to 8 to 16 in sectors per cluster. Uh, and each of those clusters is the indivisible unit, essentially, in which the file system or the, the uh, window operating system's uh, implementation of the file system hands out space for files. So if you have a cluster size that's it's, uh, 20, 48 bytes, 2 kilobytes, and you have a file that is 2049 bytes, one kilobyte plus one byte, 
you wind up getting allocated two clusters for that file. Now, no, the operating system isn't going to hand out the rest of that cluster, the rest of that now wasted cluster, to another file. So whatever data was in that cluster before that file was allocated to it is basically locked in there. And I'm going to have a slide that, that goes into a little bit more detail than that. That's this, it's Forensics 101, but if you're coming to this from a penetration testing standpoint, this may not have been something you've dug into very much. The unallocated space on the disk has the potential to hold data as well. So even so, between deleted files and unallocated files, typically a deleted file is one where we've, we've deleted it and the data is still out there. Uh, but we also still have the master file table record. We have the fat, fat entries and that sort of stuff that points to where it is. Now over time, Windows may reuse that file record and so that file record goes away and it's being used by some other file pointing to also somewhere else on the disk. That still doesn't necessarily mean that that data is gone out of free space. If the data is in free space and nothing's pointing to it, then uh, it's very difficult to find it without data carving without looking for those uh, headers and signatures or statistical analysis on how much entropy is in this sector and that sort of thing. Um, at the disk level, if you're looking at, um, if you're looking at uh, entire file systems, say if somebody has multiple volumes on their computer or, and they have, have uh, places where they store their, their MP3s and wares and things like that, uh, then there may be entire issues here where uh, maybe you delete all the files on the file system. That's, that's the same as just deleted files. Your file records are still going to likely give you away on that. If you format a file system, all you've done is uh, overwrite, those, uh, over, overwrite that file system metadata. So then you're down to data carving and you can still pull out the same data with a pretty good rate of success. Uh, and then versus the actual solution is wiping. And now if now, if you wipe a file before you delete it, if you, if you overwrite those, those sectors of data and anything and then remove that entry from the master file table, then, you know, you're securely gotten rid of it, assuming that the operating system hasn't made some other copy of it here or there. It's sneaky about that. Um, if you write zeros over your entire file system, great, you're good. You're not going to fall prey to this. Um, However, or you have to be very careful about it because one, it takes a long time and people don't like taking a long time to do anything. But uh, also on the file level, if you're doing wiping, you have to worry about things like, uh, did I ever print this file? Did it, if, it, if I printed this file, did it, did it move that file over into some print queue somewhere? If I made copies of it here and there? If it was a Word document and I opened it up, did Word save temporary copies of it here or there? I can have all my stuff in, you know, this nice TrueCrypt folder here, this nice TrueCrypt volume that's implemented in my file system. But my, file, my operating system will betray me by leaking that file all over the file system. It'll load it up into RAM and swap it out to disk, that sort of thing. And uh, so this is the sort of thing that will help you find that. And finally, we can get, you know, one-for-one -one images of, of drives with this. Uh, Assuming that the disk isn't too busy and, and we don't get a really bad image because we started imaging when it was doing one thing and ended imaging when it was doing another, uh, with the tools, the techniques I'm going to show you, you could feasibly uh, image an entire remote system and set up a copy of it in a virtual machine on your local host. Um, and there, there's some other neat tricks that, that, that may result from this too. So the Slack space example in this case, we have an example where we have a sector size of 512 bytes. Uh, that's standard sector size for any hard drive I've seen. Now, the NTFS partition boot record and everything has a, uh, has a uh, has an entry in there that says, "Oh, this byte, this this pair of bytes right here indicates how many bytes per sector are on this disk." Now, that might be something you want to start fuzzing if you're if you're into that sort of thing. Um, so, sector size is 512 bytes. Uh, cluster size of four sectors. Now. Uh, you'll see cluster sizes of, of four sectors, two sectors, eight sectors, 16, typically in powers of two. And it's basically a balance of performance as to, as to um, how efficiently can the operating system get you a set of uh, clusters to put data in and uh, how much space you want to waste. If you have, um, if you have a ton uh, on, your, on your hard drive, if you have you know, thousands and thousands of 1,500 byte files and everything, then it may make more sense to have 
two sectors per uh, two sectors per cluster, or actually four sectors per cluster, to to uh, have uh, two kilobytes per cluster, and only weighs 500 bytes or so uh, per cluster per file, rather than have uh, 16. Uh, sector uh, clusters and waste even more space per file. You, you're when, you wind up wasting more space than you ever uh, had storing data. Now, if you're on the other end of things, if you store lots of 650 meg DVD rips on your hard drive, then uh, then you don't really care so much about the the individual sectors at the end of each file that you're wasting uh, because they're small in uh, in comparison to the files that are there. And, uh, and, and so you care more about speed and performance. So you let your operating system handle things in larger cluster sizes. The, the whole bitmap that ma maps out exactly what clusters are activated or which clusters are allocated and which ones aren't, that winds up being smaller when you have larger clusters. In this example, we have the four sector cluster size. We have a file size of 4150 bytes. And uh, we have a sort of a map here of what the slack space would be for that. The red uh, blocks there are allocated or, or have the actual file data in them. Each of the smaller blocks is a, is a sector, and each of the larger yellow blocks that they're contained within are clusters. So on that last cluster is where we're interested in for, for slack space. Uh, on that last cluster, the remainder of the sector in which the file ends is what's historically called RAM slack. And it's called RAM slack because it used to be that, uh, that data was written out to these disks in, in, um, in, in these 512 byte chunks. And whatever buffer and memory that we put that into would get written out to disk just like that, and, and as it was in memory. And so essentially you would be leaking the contents of memory to your disk inside of that RAM slack. Now, with, with great dismay, I have to report to you that, that, that no Windows operating system does this since Windows 95B. Uh, even then, this is still covered in most, uh, in most uh, forensics books as being RAM slack. Uh, Linux doesn't save anything into that. It zeroes it out before it writes it out. And the reason why, and, and the reason why Microsoft and, and Windows zero this out before they write it out to disk or zero out that, that uh, sector, it's not to protect your... Is, is, is not to uh, uh, protect your personal information, but for the sheer fact that things like, uh, that, oh, I guess it is personal information, that passwords and things and other sensitive data that programs are intentionally keeping in memory can be written out to disk. Um, they assume that for the rest of this, which isn't overwritten, you wrote it out to disk at some point, so we're just going to keep it there. The disk slack, which is labeled potential goodies on this slide, uh, is where previous file contents may be. So if, that's, if that cluster had been allocated to another file previously, now that this new file, this 4150 byte file, has been allocated to this and taken up just a small little sliver of this cluster, the remainder of the sectors in that cluster will essentially stay in the state that they're in right now until this file is either added data to, resized, deleted, or something else happens. As long as this file stays here in its state, the old data that's in those additional cluster, or the additional sectors stay in their state. Now, this may be previous files. It may be previous versions of this file. Uh, depending on how the program you're using resizes things and takes data in and takes data out, it could be that this is old data from a larger version of this file. Uh, I've noticed that sometimes with, uh, with Info2 files that are contained inside of... Uh, that are contained inside of these, um, that are contained inside of uh, uh, recycling bins for file systems. A lot of times, if a lot of uh, if a lot of files have been in there and deleted, it, and and uh, then the uh, recycling bin is emptied, and a few more files are, are added to the trash bin or the recycling bin. Uh, if you look in the Slack space of that file, sometimes you'll see the file names and information about those old files that were in there because that info2 file that, that logs all the information that's in that recycling bin grows and shrinks. So can I do this already? Can I load Sleuth Kit up on the compromised target and, and go to town? Yeah, it'll work. I mean, and you can set up shop on the, on the victim's hard drive no problem. Uh, and it'll probably work. But you're going to be doing a lot of things you don't want to do. You don't want to stomp on all these deleted files. Anytime you make changes to this file system to add stuff to it to investigate things, you're likely to be stomping all over something old. Uh, it's not that stealthy, obviously. So 
So, uh, so obviously you're you know adding lots of files to the system. Uh, you can't run your your graphical tools more than likely on it, um, and it's a little less slick than what I'm proposing. So, for this with Metasploit using Merterpreter using the post modules, really nice in uh, in Metasploit, inner railgun. So railgun is what made this dead simple to implement. So. Oh, I have no idea who Patrick HVE is. Is anybody in here Patrick HVE? Raise your hand. I'm getting like five hands. Uh, <laughs> but if, if, at any rate, if Patrick HVE is here or at DEF CON, I, I want to meet him and buy him a drink because this guy's awesome. Uh, he came out with, with a set of, uh, with an extension for Meterpreter that allows you to call Windows API calls on the remote machine from your local Ruby Meterpreter post script. So either a post module or a Ruby or a Meterpreter post exploitation script. You can make function calls to DOLs on the remote system on this. It returns the data right back to you. It just as if you were on the remote system. So it makes implementing stuff like this a lot easier. So, uh, and, and this is his original posting on this. This is as much information as I could find on this guy as possible. So uh, I didn't really go too deep into dropping docs. If I do, you'll find it on Pace Bin later. Uh, so if we can call the Windows API remotely, uh, then, then we can do some interesting things. We can do essentially anything that uh, our forensic software would do. All it does is, is uh, open up open file on, uh, or, or create file on, on physical device, devices and partitions and things like that and read from them. So we can do that. We can access these physical and logical block devices directly. The physical devices being the actual full disks that are hooked up to the system. The logical devices being the individual partitions, file systems, volumes, whatever you want to call them, A, B, C, D, E. Those, uh, we can map those, uh, open those up as, as file handles. And uh, at that point, we can read arbitrary sectors from the disk. We can seek and read from wherever we want to on here. Uh, so if we can do that, we can pull any information we want out, just like our favorite forensics tools. But we don't want to be just like our, forensics fav our favorite forensics tools. We want to use our favorite forensics tools. So why not map those remote block devices to local ones? And the easiest way for me to, to do, well, I'll get into the implementation, but uh, the, the way that the, the modules that we have in here for this, uh, the, the main one, or the, the, the first one that you would run, is just enum drives.rb. Now this is based off of Rob Fuller, Mubix's code he posted to his blog once on enumerating drives, enumerating drive letters essentially. Uh, except this also has some support in it for enumerating out the physical devices as well that are underlying to those logical uh, volumes. Uh, so that basically just lets you know, hey, what can I get a hold of to run these forensics tools on? Uh, we also have an imager in here, which is just a straight up forensic style imager, very simple. This is what I implemented as a proof of concept after I started enumerating drives. And it just does byte for byte imaging of the remote drive. And it has all the things you would, ex or some of the things you would expect from, from DD or other imagers like that. Where you can set your block size, you can set at, uh, how many blocks to skip and things like that if you're doing your imaging over a period of time. So you can do byte for byte imaging. It does hashes, MD5s and H SHA1s. It's really easy to drop a line of code in there and do whatever else you would like to for hashing. Um, it can split images if you're, if you're concerned about having your 1.5 gig images so that you can move them around on thumb drives, burn them to DVDs, that sort of thing. You can, you can do all of that. And this is cool. Now, now, now this is all a lot of forensics geeks need right here. Uh, they want to be able to, uh, they want to be able to get these images of remote drives or, or, and do the, start doing their analysis offline. Uh, that's the way they do with the, even, even if they go take your stuff and bring it back to the lab, they're going to make an image of it before they do their analysis, and they're going to work from that image. And that's cool, but for the penetration testing side of things, we want to be a little bit faster. We want to uh, 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 be able to get at the data we want and not have to pull down everything. So what we have here is nbdserver.rb. So that's the post module. And these post modules should be, I've been told, in the Metasploit trunk right now. So if you do an SVN update right now, you should be able to get these and start playing with them. Um, you know, try it on your friends, all that. Um, so you can run these forensics tools locally on local block devices that are mapped to these remote block devices. 
So uh, the API calls are made over the interpreter shell. Uh, on the local side of things, on the attacker side of things, I didn't really feel like implementing you know, a Linux block device within Ruby and Metasploit. I, I, uh, I wanted it to be a little bit more pure Ruby than that. So what I did was I implemented it as a network block device. And if you're playing around with file systems, this is a really easy way to get pr it, programmatic block devices in Linux. To have a block device that basically makes calls to your stupid little Python or Ruby script. Um, it's a very, very, very simple protocol and, and basically just lets you, you uh, set up a block device, tell it how big it is, and uh, set up a function to, to receive read calls and write calls and things like that. I just do the reads on this because all we care about is write blocking. We only want read-only access to this. Now, you could patch in your own write access to this, but you're likely to completely hose the, the remote system just writing stuff to it at the same time that they're writing stuff to it and reading stuff from it. So with this, we have this direct access. The way it looks kind of diagrammed out is that on the target side, you have the disk with its volumes and things. You have the Windows API that manages access to it. Uh, you have the interpreter shell that you've spawned from your exploit. And you have, uh, on the attacker side, Metasploit talking to that interpreter shell. You've got that connection there. Uh, and, and that connection is where you know, you're issuing your interpreter commands. Uh, anytime we make that, that nice little railgun call over there and everything, where we can call that Windows API over that interpreter connection. So on our end, all we have to do is map the NBD protocol to these reads uh, on the uh, remote block devices. And we have a dev NBD0 that is the victim's hard drive or the victim's volume there. And on that, we can run our tools. So for stupid protocol tricks, one of the limitations of this right now is it's, for the victim, very Windows-centric because we're using Railgun Windows API. I, uh, you could do the same thing for, uh, you could do the same thing for or, or, or Linux or any other operating system, but you'd have to write another or module for it, essentially, because it's, it's not going to work the same way. On the attacker side, it's very Linux-centric for the most part. Now, there's NBD modules for, uh, for like BSD operating systems and things. I haven't played with them, but, but for the most part, you're looking at having a Linux Metasploit attacker there. Now, that's not much of a problem for, for most folks here, but it would be nice at some point to get this working you know, native to Windows. And, and I'm, I'm going to work on that. Now, uh, I was running Linux free forensics tools on this to demo and, and to develop my demo and hacking around with it. And I was very happy with it because I like Sleuth Kit. I like, you know, all your, your crazy uh, command line forensics tools. But you really want to be able to use these nice graphical tools, tools like, like FTK, Imager, and, and things like that on the Windows side. Uh, the problem is, is that Windows has no, uh, has no NBD support. I can't just set up you know, a Linux VM with an NBD server and connect to it with Windows. And I was like, well, I guess I'll have to get around to you know, writing some Windows block device driver and everything at some point. But then it dawned on me maybe a week and a half ago, it's like, hey, I can, uh, on the Linux side of things, create an iSCSI server, and, uh, and Windows does support iSCSI. So we have our stupid protocol trick here of layering iSCSI on top of NBD to be able to run these Windows-based tools. Now, in the future, it would be nice to have like a Ruby implementation of iSCSI. I haven't looked into the protocol. Maybe it's easy. Maybe it's hard. I don't know. All I know is that, that Windows built-in support for iSCSI is, is kind of awful. Uh, it, it hangs up. It crashes a lot and everything. And I don't think it's my fault, but, uh, but it might be. Uh, but it seems I would, I would hate to be using this for anything but hacks. Let's see. So, and that's what I'm going to demo. I'm going to demo the iSCSI stuff. So the caveats and exercises for the reader. For the network side of things, we're doing this over crazy network connections and weird APIs and things like that at Railgun and all that. So speed is an issue. Uh, obviously, he, reading somebody's hard drive over the internet is not going to be as fast as reading it over a SATA cable directly. Uh, that's one of the nice things about mapping the block device is that we can, you know, read the sectors that have our master file table and go directly to the things we're interested in, hopefully. Uh, but it, it may d turn out that if you're interested in data carving 
or if you're interested in, in, uh, in imaging, it may be the sort of thing where you have to do this over a period of a very long time. Uh, but you know, as long as the system's up, you know, let it roll. Uh, you may even want to throttle it at some point to, to be a little less, uh, be a little more stealthy. Because as it is right now, it just goes flat out however fast it can do it. And which isn't brilliantly fast, but it's fast enough that if somebody was watching their network traffic very carefully, they'd be like, hey, that's my disk going by. Um, so, uh, so you may want to put some throttling in there. Right now it doesn't have all that. I'm assuming you know Ruby and you can hack that stuff in. As I need it, I might hack it in. Um, we want cleaner cross-platform implementation. I want it to where or, uh, maybe I can target other operating systems. Maybe I can run the attacker side on something other than Linux. Uh, and that might, be in, that might involve uh, 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 writing some modules or plugins for Metasploit that, that make this a little bit, more, uh, a little bit more versatile. But for now, it's a cool proof of concept. So for the conclusion for this, before I do my demo, is we want to go and wring out some more data out of these systems. So uh, uh, the things that you hack now, get more out of them. So this builds capability for forensic examiners, uh, examiners, uh, uh, forensic examiners and investigators, sort of combine those words, and the penetration testers who, uh, who do this sort of stuff for clients. And it also encourages people to securely wipe things because now, all the folks that are you know, checking for compliance can now see, did you really securely wipe that, not just did you wipe that? So now for my demos, we will switch over here. And uh, you'll have to forgive me that I have like some very basic notes here on, on exactly what I need to type to get this stuff working. To introduce you to all the actors in this demo, we have our victim here running XP Service Pack 3, uh, which should be easy to reliably knock over. Uh, we have our attacker machine running Ubuntu Linux with, with old school Metasploit 3 on it. I did not upgrade this to 4 for fear of my demo breaking. Uh, and we have a forensics workstation here running Windows XP that has FTK Imager on it that we can look at these drives on. So, uh, so if you've ever had a favorite exploit, uh, like something that you know always just works and it works reliably, mine is the MS0807, uh, MS0806.7. So we're going to load up the interpreter console here and hopefully that won't take too terribly long. While that's loading up, uh, just to brief you on the other stuff we're gonna do, we're gonna set this up. We're going to uh, use the MS0806.7. We're going to just use standard bind TCP interpreter. We're going to set our target, targeting here, hoping, hoping, hoping that the victim's IP address hasn't hopped something else. We'll check on that before we run it. And we're going to exploit it. And then we're going to look at the list of drives and we're going to map a device. Or actually a, a, a logical volume, to be honest. Good old MSF console taking its time. After we do that, we're going to show you how we can look at the, the hex of the drive directly to just kind of show you, hey, hey this really is a block device. Um, we're going to mount it and take a look at things, maybe undelete some files, uh, and then look at it in FTK Imager on the Windows side of things. And we're up. So we're going to uh, load up the MS080.6.7 is like my family. Let's see, set the payload. Helps type it right. And we're going to do a couple things here on the victim side of things before we get rolling with it. One, I'm going to double check my IP address here just to make sure for the sake of time. Yay, it's still where I left it. Uh, we, on our victim here, we have a nice little CSV file of personally identifiable information. Before y'all get out your, your cell phone cameras and things like that, take pictures of this. This is from fakenamegenerator.com. Uh, so, uh, not real. Uh, just to make things interesting, we're going to make a copy of this. And then do like a, we'll do a command line delete just to make sure that it uh, doesn't go to the recycling bin. So we made a copy of it, got rid of it, that sort of thing, no problem. So 
Set our remote hose to our victim, 68, and then I can remember it, 93, 155. Feel free to try that IP address out on your local network. Uh, and we exploit, and, and please do not let me down. And we've got a shell, so cool. So now we can run our post modules. First one is going to be enum devices, or enum, um, uh, yeah, devices here. Let me see. Yeah, enum drives. Now, uh, on, on my local machine, this is in the Windows Gather uh, uh, folder. Uh, when they put it in trunk, they may have put it somewhere else, but I think this makes sense. So it's probably there still. Oops. No RB. So on this, it's uh, reporting that we have a physical drive that's 40 gigs, uh, which is entirely consumed by the, uh, the C drive. So we're going to now set up an NBD server. And it's device to point to that C drive so that we can look at it locally and remotely. So now one little trick here is you can do these backslashes is but you'd have to escape them but the forward slashes work just as well here. So we do forward slashes so we don't have to type two for every one. And that sets up our NBD server. So over here we're going to use the NBD client to map it. Running on port 10,005. I don't know what the standard MBD port is, so whatever. We're going to put it on MBD 0, and that mapped it locally. So now we can take a look at this in uh, a hex viewer and see that we have a drive there, hopefully. And yeah, there, so there's your partition boot record for the first 512 bytes. Disk read error occurs, NT loader, all that sort of stuff. These things, if you see these things on your computer, you might as well reinstall. Uh, and then it moves on, and eventually you'd get to the master file table and data and things like that. We're not going to take you on the grand tour of NTFS here. But what we are going to do is we're going to mount this. So we can mount this read-only to the victim mount point that I have in this directory. And you'll notice that anything that accesses the drive through this is a little bit on the slow side, but it's, it's, it's worthy. It's, it, it's worthy of being intera called interactive, at least. It's going to embarrass me by taking even longer than it usually does. Mm -hmm. dum, dum. Oh, come on. Ah, there we go. That's all I had to say. So uh, now we can go into there. And I don't remember, so tab, thank you. We can go into that victim's desktop. And we have the file system we expected. We can, uh, we can look at the PII.csv that's on his desktop just like normal. Now, we're, we've mounted the drive. We're looking at it through normal file system functions here, so it's not like it's a, a, you know, a, anything crazy right now. We can't you know, view deleted files and things like that. But you know, we can at least run any kind of script that would look through a normal file system for things. We can run it on a remote one now. Cool. So. So unmount that. Now uh, with NTFS on delete, we can undelete deleted files, and that uses the uh, the master file table to find those files that have been deleted but are still hanging around with file records and things like that. Uh, we'll undelete anything starting with CSD on dev nbd zero, and that's not how you do it apparently. Oh, I know. Dash M, I think. Yeah, there we go. And now I'll take its moment to do its thing. Uh, while that's rolling, I'm going to start a new tab here. Oops. And show you how we set it up for iSCSI access. So for that, we have iatd.conf. Oops. Sudo make me a sandwich. 
And so on that, we just have an iSCSI uh, uh, target set up. In the iSCSI language, a target is essentially the server side of the file system, and the, uh, and the, the initiator is the, uh, is the client side. So this is how we set it up very insecurely for the target side of things. Uh, I wouldn't recommend doing this this way on anything other than your, your own local home network, heavily firewalled. Did this undelete anything? Yeah, okay, so meanwhile, over in NTFS undelete land, it's undeleted that copy of PII.CSV and uh, put it on the local file system for us to look at. Now, when we undelete these things, we don't mark them as being undeleted on the remote file system. We simply make copies of the data over to the local. So in this case, we have a copy of that that we had deleted before with all the personally identifiable information of random non-existent people. So on this side of things here, we're going to sudo etsy and start up the iSCSI server. iSCSI target start. And that doesn't take long. Now on the Windows side, we can go to our control panel. And uh, I have no idea where it is in there, and I always just wind up doing the search to find the iSCSI initiator. And then we punch in the IP address for our attacker machine, which is running the iSCSI server, 93.163. 93.163. Click connect. And we're connected. So hopefully that'll work. And now we can load up FTK Imager just like we train people to do who, uh, you know, in a period of very little time. We're going to add it as a physical drive, and we're going to give it this physical drive one, which is the iSCSI remote device here. And it'll take it a moment, and it'll add it to our evidence tree, and we can just browse it around it graphically. You gotta crank it a little bit faster sometimes. I blow on the network connections, but it's all virtual. Uh, so now we have the physical drive located, just like it was hooked up with a write blocker. We can view all the unallocated space, not gonna bother with that for now. And we can navigate on down to that uh, victim's, uh, victim's desktop and look at that PII on there. So that's another way of going about it. As you can see, it's slow, but uh, a lot of things in forensics, uh, when we teach the, the, the cops about this and the veterans about this, it's always, as we, we teach them about things that are, five, that are 4.30 in the afternoon, things, things that are going to run overnight, so you might as well do it before you leave for work early, and uh, the 4.30 in the afternoon on Friday things, where you set it to run on Friday before you leave, leave to go home for the weekend. Uh, so, so this is that sort of thing in, in some cases where you're gonna have to schedule things out and time things out to where you can do things on a, on a reasonable time scale. But uh, the extra stuff that you get out of it may be worth it. So with that, um, so in the desktop here, we see our, so we see our deleted file, copy of PS, uh, PS, PII.csv. We see the file slack for it. FTK Imager has a great interface for viewing file slack for files. So that's uh, old garbage data from something else there. And we have our original file. And it's being slow to switch to. Yep, there it goes. So with that, we kind of end up... Uh, one of the things they told me, too, is to remind you to complete your feedback form so that they know which talks were good, which ones sucked, that sort of thing. And uh, with the remaining time, I'll take questions. So.